Question 26, Part 2 of Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde Treatise on the Theological Virtues The Virtue of Charity This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde Treatise on the Theological Virtues the virtue of charity by saint thomas aquinas translated by the fathers of the english dominican province question twenty six of the order of charity in thirteen articles part two articles seven through thirteen seventh article whether we ought to love those who are better more than those who are more closely united to us Objection 1. It would seem that we ought to love those who are better more than those who are more closely united to us. For that which is in no way hateful seems more lovable than that which is hateful for some reason, just as a thing is all the whiter for having less black mixed with it. Now those who are connected with us are hateful for some reason, according to Luke 14.26. If any man come to me and hate not his father, etc. On the other hand, good men are not hateful for any reason. Therefore, it seems that we ought to love those who are better more than those who are more closely connected with us. Objection to. Further, by charity above all, man is likened to God. But God loves more the better man. Therefore, man also, out of charity, ought to love the better man more than one who is more closely united to him. Objection 3. Further, in every friendship, that ought to be loved most, which has most to do with the foundation of that friendship. For, by natural friendship, we love most those who are connected with us by nature, our parents, for instance, or our children. Now the friendship of charity is founded upon the fellowship of happiness, which has more to do with better men than with those who are more closely united to us. Therefore, out of charity, we ought to love better men more than those who are more closely connected with us. On the contrary, it is written in 1 Timothy 5, 8. If any man have not care of his own, and especially of those of his house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Now the inward affection of charity ought to correspond to the outward effect. Therefore, charity regards those who are nearer to us before those who are better. I answer that. Every act should be proportionate both to its object and to the agent. But from its object it takes its species, while from the power of the agent it takes the mode of its intensity. Thus movement has its species from the term to which it tends, while the intensity of its speed arises from the disposition of the thing moved and the power of the mover. Accordingly, love takes its species from its object, but its intensity is due to the lover. Now the object of charity's love is God, and man is the lover. Therefore, the specific diversity of the love which is in accordance with charity, as regards the love of our neighbor, depends on his relation to God so that, out of charity, we should wish a greater good to one who is nearer to God. For though the good which charity wishes to all, notably everlasting happiness, is one in itself, yet it has various degrees according to various shares of happiness, and it belongs to charity to wish God's justice to be maintained, in accordance with which better men have a fuller share of happiness. 
and this regards the species of love. For there are different species of love according to the different goods that we wish for those whom we love. On the other hand, the intensity of love is measured with regard to the man who loves, and accordingly man loves those who are more closely united to him with more intense affection as to the good he wishes for them, than he loves those who are better as to the greater good he wishes for them. Again, a further difference must be observed here. For some neighbors are connected with us by their natural origin, a connection which cannot be severed, since that origin makes them to be what they are. But the goodness of virtue, wherein some are close to God, can come and go, increase and decrease, as was shown above in question 24, articles 4, 10, and 11. Hence, it is possible for one, out of charity, to wish this man who is more closely united to one to be better than another, and so reach a higher degree of happiness. Moreover, there is yet another reason for which, out of charity, we love more those who are more nearly connected with us, since we love them in more ways. For towards those who are not connected with us, we have no other friendship than charity, whereas for those who are connected with us, we have certain other friendships according to the way in which they are connected. Now since the good on which every other friendship of the virtuous is based is directed as to its end, the good on which charity is based, it follows that charity commands each act of another friendship, even as the art which is about the end commands the art which is about the means. Consequently, this very act of loving someone, because he is akin or connected with us, or because he is a fellow countryman, or for any like reason that is referable to the end of charity, can be commanded by charity, so that, out of charity, both eliciting and commanding, we love in more ways those who are more nearly connected with us. Reply to Objection 1. We are commanded to hate, in our kindred, not their kinship, but only the fact of their being an obstacle between us and God. In this respect, they are not akin but hostile to us, according to Micah 7.6. A men's enemies are they of his own household. Reply to Objection 2. Charity conforms man to God proportionately by making man comport himself towards what is his, as God does toward what is his. For we may, out of charity, will certain things as becoming to us which God does not will, because it becomes him not to will them, as stated above in the Pars Prima Secundae, question 19, article 10, when we were treating of the goodness of the will. Reply to Objection 3. Charity elicits the act of love not only as regards the object, but also as regards the lover, as stated above. The result is that the man who is more nearly united to us is more loved. Eighth Article. Whether we ought to love more those who are connected with us by ties of blood. Objection 1. It would seem that we ought not to love more those who are more closely united to us by ties of blood. For it is written in Proverbs 18.24, A man amiable in society shall be more friendly than a brother. Again, Valerius Maximus says, in his nine books of memorable deeds and sayings, 4-7, the ties of friendship are most strong and in no way yield to the ties of blood. Moreover, it is quite certain and undeniable that as to the latter, the lot of birth is fortuitous, whereas we contract the former by an untrammeled will and a solid pledge. 
Therefore, we ought not to love more than others, those who are united to us by ties of blood. Objection to. Further, Ambrose says in On the Duties of the Clergy, 1-7, I love not less you, whom I have begotten in the gospel, than if I had begotten you in wedlock, for nature is no more eager to love than grace. Surely we ought to love those whom we expect to be with us for evermore than those who will be with us only in this world. Therefore, we should not love our kindred more than those who are otherwise connected with us. Objection 3. Further, love is proved by deeds, as Gregory states in his homily on the Gospel, number 30. Now we are bound to do acts of love to others than our kindred. Thus in the army a man must obey his officer rather than his father. Therefore, we are not bound to love our kindred most of all. On the contrary, the commandments of the Decalogue contain a special precept about the honor due to our parents. Confer Exodus 20.12 therefore we ought to love more specially those who are united to us by ties of blood i answer that as stated above in article seven we ought out of charity to love those who are more closely united to us more both because our love for them is more intense and because there are more reasons for loving them now intensity of love arises from the union of lover and beloved, and therefore we should measure the love of different persons according to the different kinds of union, so that a man is more loved in matters touching that particular union in respect of which he is loved. And again, in comparing love to love, we should compare one union with another. Accordingly, we must say that friendship among blood relations is based upon their connection by natural origin, the friendship of fellow citizens on their civic fellowship, and the friendship of those who are fighting side by side on the comradeship of battle. Wherefore, in matters pertaining to nature, we should love our kindred most. In matters concerning relations between citizens, we should prefer our fellow citizens and on the battlefield, our fellow soldiers. Hence, the philosopher says, in Ethics 9.2, that it is our duty to render to each class of people such respect as is natural and appropriate. This is, in fact, the principle upon which we seem to act, for we invite our relations to a wedding. It would seem to be a special duty to afford our parents the means of living, and to honor them. The same applies to other kinds of friendship. If, however, we compare union with union, it is evident that the union arising from natural origin is prior to and more stable than all others, because it is something affecting the very substance, whereas other unions supervene and may cease altogether. Therefore, the friendship of kindred is more stable, while other friendships may be stronger in respect of that which is proper to each of them. Reply to Objection 1. Inasmuch as the friendship of comrades originates through their own choice, love of this kind takes precedence of the love of kindred in matters where we are free to do as we choose, for instance, in matters of action. Yet the friendship of kindred is more stable, since it is more natural, and preponderates over others in matters touching nature. Consequently, we are more beholden to them in the providing of necessaries. Reply to Objection 2. Ambrose is speaking of love with regard to favors respecting the fellowship of grace namely, 
moral instruction. For in this matter, a man ought to provide for his spiritual children whom he has begotten spiritually more than for the sons of his body whom he is bound to support in bodily sustenance. Reply to Objection 3. The fact that in the battle a man obeys his officer rather than his father proves that he loves his father less, not simply but relatively, that is, as regards the love which is based on fellowship in battle. Ninth Article Whether a man ought, out of charity, to love his children more than his father? Objection 1. It seems that a man ought, out of charity, to love his children more than his father. For we ought to love those more to whom we are more bound to do good. Now we are more bound to do good to our children than to our parents, since the Apostle says in Second Corinthians 12.14, Neither ought the children to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Therefore, a man ought to love his children more than his parents. Objection to. Further, grace perfects nature. But parents naturally love their children more than these love them, as the philosopher states in Ethics 8.12. Therefore, a man ought to love his children more than his parents. Objection 3. Further, man's affections are conformed to God by charity. But God loves his children more than they love him. Therefore, we also ought to love our children more than our parents. On the contrary, Ambrose says, We ought to love God first, then our parents, then our children, and lastly those of our household. I answer that, as stated above in Article 4, First Reply, and in Article 7. The degrees of love may be measured from two standpoints. First, from that of the object. In this respect, the better a thing is, and the more like to God, the more is it to be loved. And in this way, a man ought to love his father more than his children, because to wit, he loves his father as his principle, in which respect he is a more exalted good and more like God. Secondly, the degrees of love may be measured from the standpoint of the lover, and in this respect a man loves more that which is more closely connected with him, in which way a man's children are more lovable to him than his father, as the philosopher states in Ethics 8. First, because parents love their children as being part of themselves, whereas the father is not part of his son, so that the love of a father for his children is more like a man's love for himself. Secondly, because parents know better that so-and-so is their child than vice versa. Thirdly, because children are nearer to their parents as being part of them than their parents are to them to whom they stand in relation of a principle. Fourthly, because parents have loved longer, for the father begins to love his child at once, whereas the child begins to love his father after a lapse of time. And the longer love lasts, the stronger it is, according to Ecclesiasticus 9.14. Forsake not an old friend, for the new will not be like to him. Reply to Objection 1. The debt due to a principle is submission of respect and honor, whereas that due to the effect is one of influence and care. Hence the duty of children to their parents consists chiefly in honor, while that of parents to their children is especially one of care. Reply to Objection 2. It is natural for a man as father to love his children more if we consider them as closely connected with him. 
but if we consider which is the more exalted good, the son naturally loves his father more. Reply to Objection 3. As Augustine says, in On Christian Doctrine 132, God loves us for our good and for his honor. Wherefore, since our Father is related to us as principle, even as God is, it belongs properly to the Father to receive honor from his children, and to the children to be provided by their parents with what is good for them. Nevertheless, in cases of necessity, the child is bound out of the favors received to provide for his parents before all. Tenth Article Whether a man ought to love his mother more than his father. Objection 1. It would seem that a man ought to love his mother more than his father. For, as the philosopher says in On the Generation of Animals, 120, the female produces the body in generation. Now man receives his soul, not from his father, but from God by creation, as stated in the first part, question 90, article 2, and question 118. Therefore, a man receives more from his mother than from his father, and consequently, he ought to love her more than him. Objection to. Further, where greater love is given, greater love is due. Now a mother loves her child more than the father does, for the philosopher says in Ethics 9-7 that mothers have greater love for their children, for the mother labors more in childbearing, and she knows more surely than the father who are her children. Objection 3. Further, love should be more fond toward those who have labored for us more, according to Romans 16.6. 6. Salute Mary, who hath labored much among you. Now the mother labors more than the father in giving birth and education to her child, Wherefore it is written in Ecclesiasticus 7.29, Forget not the groanings of thy mother. Therefore, a man ought to love his mother more than his father. On the contrary, Jerome says on Ezekiel 44.25 that, Man ought to love God the father of all, and then his own father and mentions the mother afterwards. I answer that, in making such comparisons as this, we must take the answer in the strict sense, so that the present question is whether the father as father ought to be loved more than the mother as mother. The reason is that virtue and vice may make such a difference in such like matters that friendship may be diminished or destroyed, as the philosopher remarks in Ethics 8.7. Hence Ambrose says, Good servants should be preferred to wicked children. Strictly speaking, however, the father should be loved more than the mother, for father and mother are loved as principles of our natural origin. Now the father is principal in a more excellent way than the mother, because he is the active principle, while the mother is a passive and material principle. Consequently, strictly speaking, the father is to be loved more. Reply to Objection 1. In the begetting of man, the mother supplies the formless matter of the body, and the latter receives its form through the formative power that is in the semen of the father. And though this power cannot create the rational soul, yet it disposes the matter of the body to receive that form. Reply to Objection 2. This applies to another kind of love. For the friendship between lover and lover differs specifically from the friendship between child and parent. While the friendship we are speaking of here is that which a man owes his father and mother through being begotten of them. 
the reply to the third objection is evident. 11th article whether a man ought to love his wife more than his father and mother objection one it would seem that a man ought to love his wife more than his father and mother for no man leaves a thing for another unless he love the latter more now it is written in genesis two twenty four that a man shall leave father and mother on account of his wife therefore a man ought to love his wife more than his father and mother objection to further the apostle says in ephesians five thirty three that a husband should love his wife as himself now a man ought to love himself more than his parents therefore he ought to love his wife also more than his parents objection to further love should be greater where there are more reasons for loving now there are more reasons for love in the friendship of a man towards his wife for the philosopher says in ethics eight twelve that in this friendship there are the motives of utility pleasure and also of virtue if husband and wife are virtuous therefore a man's love for his wife ought to be greater than his love for his parents. On the contrary, according to Ephesians 5.28, men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Now a man ought to love his body less than his neighbor, as stated above in Article 5. And among his neighbors, he should love his parents most, Therefore, he ought to love his parents more than his wife. I answer that, as stated above in Article 9, the degrees of love may be taken from the good, which is loved, or from the union between those who love. On the part of the good, which is the object loved, a man should love his parents more than his wife, because he loves them as his principles and considered as a more exalted good. But on the part of the union, the wife ought to be loved more, because she is united with her husband as one flesh, according to Matthew 19.6. Therefore, now they are not two, but one flesh. Consequently, a man loves his wife more intensely but his parents with greater reverence. Reply to Objection 1. A man does not in all respects leave his father and mother for the sake of his wife. For in certain cases, a man ought to succor his parents rather than his wife. He does, however, leave all his kinsfolk and cleaves to his wife as regards the union of carnal connection and cohabitation. Reply to Objection 2. The words of the Apostle do not mean that a man ought to love his wife equally with himself, but that a man's love for himself is the reason for his love of his wife, since she is one with him. Reply to Objection 3. There are also several reasons for a man's love for his father, and these, in a certain respect, namely, as regards good, are more weighty than those for which a man loves his wife, although the latter outweigh the former as regards the closeness of the union. As to the argument in the contrary sense, it must be observed that in the words quoted the particle as denotes not equality of love, but the motive of love. For the principal reason why a man loves his wife is her being united to him in the flesh. Twelfth article. Whether a man ought to love more his benefactor than one he has benefited. Objection 1. It would seem that a man ought to love his benefactor more than one he has benefited. 
where Augustine says in On the Catechizing of the Uninstructed, for Nothing will incite another more to love you than that you love him first. For he must have a hard heart indeed, who not only refuses to love, but declines to return love already given. Now a man's benefactor forestalls him in the kindly deeds of charity. Therefore, we ought to love our benefactors above all. Objection to further. The more grievously we sin by ceasing to love a man or by working against him, the more we ought to love him. Now, it is a more grievous sin to cease loving a benefactor or to work against him than to cease loving one to whom one has hitherto done kindly actions. Therefore, we ought to love our benefactors more than those to whom we are kind. Objection 3. Further, of all things lovable, God is to be loved most, and then one's father, as Jerome says, in his commentary on Ezekiel 44.25. Now these are our greatest benefactors. Therefore, a benefactor should be loved above all others. On the contrary, the philosopher says, in Ethics 9.7 that benefactors seem to love recipients of their benefactions rather than vice versa. I answer that, as stated above in Articles 9 and 11, a thing is loved more in two ways. First, because it has the character of a more excellent good. Secondly, by reason of a closer connection. In the first way, we ought to love our benefactor most, because, since he is a principle of good to the man he has benefited, he has the character of a more excellent good, as stated above with regard to one's father, in Article 9. In the second way, however, we love those more who have received benefactions from us, as the philosopher proves in Ethics 9.7, by four arguments. First, because the recipient of benefactions is the handiwork of the benefactor, so that we are wont to say of a man, he was made by so and so. Now it is natural to a man to love his own work, thus it is to be observed that poets love their own poems, and the reason is that we love to be and to live, and these are made manifest in our action. Secondly, because we all naturally love that in which we see our own good. Now it is true that the benefactor has some good of his in the recipient of his benefaction, and the recipient of some good in the benefactor. But the benefactor sees his virtuous good in the recipient, while the recipient sees his useful good in the benefactor. Now it gives more pleasure to see one's virtuous good than one's useful good, both because it is more enduring, for usefulness quickly flits by, and the pleasure of calling a thing to mind is not like the pleasure of having it present, and because it is more pleasant to recall virtuous goods than the profit we have derived from others. Thirdly, because it is the lover's part to act, since he wills and works the good of the beloved, while the beloved takes a passive part in receiving good, so that to love surpasses being loved, for which reason the greater love is on the part of the benefactor. Fourthly, because it is more difficult to give than to receive favors, and we are most fond of things which have cost us most trouble, while we almost despise what comes easy to us. Reply to Objection 1. It is something in the benefactor that incites the recipient to love him, whereas the benefactor loves the recipient not through being incited by him, but through being moved thereto of his own accord. And what we do of our own accord surpasses what we do through another. 
Reply to Objection 2. The love of the beneficiary for the benefactor is more of a duty, wherefore the contrary is the greater sin. On the other hand, the love of the benefactor for the beneficiary is more spontaneous, wherefore it is quicker to act. Reply to Objection 3. God also loves us more than we love him, and parents love their children more than these love them. Yet it does not follow that we love all who have received good from us more than any of our benefactors. For we prefer such benefactors as God and our parents, from whom we have received the greatest favors, to those on whom we have bestowed lesser benefits. Thirteenth Article Whether the Order of Charity Endures in Heaven Objection 1. It would seem that the order of charity does not endure in heaven. For Augustine says in On the True Religion, 48, Perfect charity consists in loving greater goods more, and lesser goods less. Now charity will be perfect in heaven. Therefore, a man will love those who are better more than either himself or those who are connected with him. Objection to. Further, we love him more to whom we wish a greater good. Now each one in heaven wishes a greater good for those who have more good, else his will would not be conformed in all things to God's will. And there to be better is to have more good. Therefore, in heaven, each one loves more those who are better, and consequently, he loves others more than himself, and one who is not connected with him more than one who is. Objection 3. Further, in heaven, love will be entirely for God's sake, for then will be fulfilled the words of 1 Corinthians 15.28 that God may be all in all. Therefore, he who is nearer God will be loved more, so that a man will love a better man more than himself, and one who is not connected with him more than one who is. On the contrary, nature is not done away, but perfected by glory. Now the order of charity given above in Articles 2, 3, and 4, is derived from nature, since all things naturally love themselves more than others. Therefore, this order of charity will endure in heaven. I answer that. The order of charity must needs remain in heaven as regards the love of God above all things. For this will be realized simply when man shall enjoy God perfectly. But, as regards the order between man himself and other men, a distinction would seem to be necessary, because, as we have stated above in Articles 7 and 9, the degrees of love may be distinguished either in respect of the good which a man desires for another, or according to the intensity of love itself. In the first way, a man will love better men more than himself, and those who are less good less than himself, because, by reason of the perfect conformity of the human to the divine will, each of the blessed will desire everyone to have what is due to him, according to divine justice. Nor will that be a time for advancing by means of merit to yet greater reward, as happens now, while it is possible for a man to desire both the virtue and the reward of a better man, whereas then the will of each one will rest within the limits determined by God. But in the second way, a man will love himself more than even his better neighbors, because the intensity of the act of love arises on the part of the person who loves, as stated above in Article 7 and 9. Moreover, it is for this that the gift of charity is bestowed by God on each one, 
namely, that he may first of all direct his mind to God, and this pertains to a man's love for himself, and that, in the second place, he may wish other things to be directed to God, and even work for that end according to his capacity. As to the order to be observed among our neighbors, a man will simply love those who are better, according to the love of charity. Because the entire life of the blessed consists in directing their minds to God, wherefore the entire ordering of their love will be ruled with respect to God, so that each one will love more and reckon to be nearer to himself those who are nearer to God. For then, one man will no longer succor another, as he needs to in the present life, wherein each man has to succor those who are closely connected with him, rather than those who are not, no matter what be the nature of their distress. Hence it is that in this life, a man, by the inclination of charity, loves more those who are more closely united to him, for he is under a greater obligation to bestow on them the effect of charity. It will, however, be possible in heaven for a man to love in several ways one who is connected with him, since the causes of virtuous love will not be banished from the mind of the blessed. Yet all these reasons are incomparably surpassed by that which is taken from the nighness to God. Reply to Objection 1. This argument should be granted as to those who are connected together, but as regards man himself, he ought to love himself so much the more than others, as his charity is more perfect, since perfect charity directs man to God perfectly, for God is man's entire reason of his love, and this belongs to the love of oneself as stated above. Reply to Objection 2. This argument considers the order of charity in respect of the degree of good one wills the person one loves. Reply to Objection 3. God will be to each one the entire reason of his love, for God is man's entire good. For if we make the impossible supposition that God were not man's good, he would not be man's reason for loving. Hence it is that, in the order of love, man should love himself more than all else after God. End of question 26. Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C.